up to those in the sanctuary and those worshiping with us online. We are glad that you are joining us. I'd like to um, introduce the Reverend Ron Rocky. Ron was my seminary in 2009 at um, St. Andrew, and he's the former pastor, retired pastor, pastor emeritus, uh, not yet, but soon, at Southminster. And so Ron and Janice are here today. He will also be preaching on July 3rd, but I invited him to preach today so you could get a different voice in the pulpit. And um, I'm grateful to Ron for so many things, but most of all for being a dear friend and a great colleague. And he was all worried about being a seminarian of me, and it turned out great. So a couple of announcements. The first is that session does meet on Tuesday, um, and that's at 7 p.m. here. And then you might have seen the signs on the doors and on our website and things like that about the cyber safety um, program next week. Um, it's at 4 o'clock, I think. The 4 to 6. Is that what time it is? And yes, 4 o'clock. Your Child in Cyber Safety. And if you need more information about that, it's on our website. Also, out in the narthex on the table over here, um, our sign up sheets for um, making coffee bringing snacks. What's the other one? Uh, oh, and if you would like to donate, bring flowers or donate flowers in someone's honor or memory, um, you can sign up for Sundays all the way through November. So have a look at it. You'll have a fun time. Are there any other announcements today? It's a quiet day. Okay. Enjoy and in celebration, let us worship God. Please join with me in our call to worship. Come, walk with God in these moments of worship. Celebrate God's covenant with us and all humankind. Surely God is in this place today. We find refuge and strength as we gather. Be still and know that God is God. All our names for God are limited metaphors. The Most High lives in us and among us. The whole universe is God's dwelling. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Let us pray. Creator God, you have made a world of such amazing diversity with unique living things we cannot number in an interdependent pattern on which all life depends. 
We praise you for such wonder. You have created such amazing diversity in humankind through culture and language, custom and community, expressed in creativity and compassion over and over again. We praise you for such wonder in Jesus Christ. You show us how much you love your creation and how we can live by your love. By the power of your spirit, give us new eyes to behold the wonders you have made and teach us how to share in the praise your creation offers you day by day. Amen. Join me in the prayer of confession. Creator God, the diversity in your creation amazes us, but we confess we prefer what seems familiar. We'd like everyone to speak our language. We wish others held our values and shared our customs. We don't understand discrimination that hurts others. We don't recognize how our own preferences affect other people and the earth itself in harmful ways. Forgive our familiar assumptions and open our minds and hearts to the stories of others and the cries of suffering throughout the earth. Amen. Hear the good news. The prophet Micah declared that God requires only three, three things of us, to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. To all who truly repent, who turn away from arrogance and seek reconciliation with God and neighbor in kindness and humility, God offers forgiveness and peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us greet one another this morning with the peace of Christ.
have you sit right here. Yep, I'll be right back, okay? Don't move. Stay. Don't move. Good job. Good face. Very well. I have props. That's why I'm going back here. Hey, Max. We've made bags for when kids are here, like you. Okay, so pick one out. Show, which one should I show you? This one, this one, or this one? This one? Okay. Okay. So let's unpack the bag together. And I'll show you what's all in here. Okay, now the deal with this bag is, this stays at church. It doesn't go home with you. Okay? Because we'd be sewing our fingers off. We had to replace them all the time. Okay, so in here, let's see. Oh, look. It's a bear you can play with. And there's other animals, too. And our favorite things, chenille sticks. I realize we used to call them pipe cleaners when I was a kid, but now they're chenille sticks because we don't smoke. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they're called. They're called chenille sticks. So, but you can make all sorts of things with these. Okay? And I bet, um, bet your dad would like to help make things. We make people. What else is in here? Oh, we have puppets. There's a couple puppets in here. What's the other puppet? Oh, the other puppet is Supermom. So you have, he looks like a construction worker, right? And what's she? These are like really aged, you guys. Um, okay, so this says Supermom. And then in her pocket, she has car keys and a list that says grocery store and soccer practice. Really, we need to change these up a little bit. Um, Oh, you want that one too? Okay, there you go. And then we have pictures for you to color. Okay? You can take these home with you if you'd like. And this says, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. And this says, Alleluia. And then there's a book you can read. That's all. Oh, and there's crayons. They're supposed to be crayons. Oh, there's the crayons. Here are the crayons. Okay? So this is this bag. The only thing that will switch every week are the pictures that you color. So when you're done, this is going to be back by the door. So when you come in, you can take it. Take one of your bags. And maybe you want a different animal sometime. But the puppets are in all the bags, too. Okay? You got them on there? What would you name this guy? You don't know? That's what mmm means, right? I can translate. Mmm. What would you name her? Well, let's think of some names. Um, what's a name? Hmm. What's the name of somebody in your class? You don't know? Well, you're not in school right now, so you don't have a name in your class. Who is, is name somebody that is in this church? Do you know anybody's name in the church? Okay, we're going to make this one Ron, okay? Because we have a lot of Rons, and we got a Ron back here now, okay? today, and I'm going to brush her hair out of her hands. We're going to name her, let's name her Mary for today, okay? So, yep. Would Ron and Mary like to pray with us? No? Well, hey, Ron and Mary, we're going to pray anyway, okay? Okay, let's do a prayer. Dear God, Good job. We thank you for helping us learn about you through puppets and coloring and reading and love. Amen. Okay, so here's your bag. Okay, don't forget Rod and Mary. There you go. Come back in there. Okay, so these these this will be available at the at the opening of our the doors of our church, and we will have more bags. But these are the three that are made right now. So, and they have different animals, different books. Okay, so when you're done, we'll just ask you to hang it back up. Okay, you can't take it home. No, sorry, bud. No, I know. 
but you can take the pictures home. The crayons stay also. Yeah, and the animals. Okay, got it? Those are all the rules. The puppets stay too. Yeah, Ron and Mary stay. And maybe they change their, their names every week. You think? Yeah. Well, it's not a panda. It's a purple bear. It's not, it's not a panda. <laughs> Boy, next time you get them. <laughs> it looks more like a bush baby bear than a panda. You're not so sure? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I don't think so. Will you please join with me in a prayer for illumination and understanding? God of wisdom and hope, your word has offered guidance and healing throughout many generations. Send us your spirit now that as we listen to the stories of your people, we may find wisdom and hope, guidance and healing through your living word, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our epistle lesson today comes to us from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our hearts are open.
wonder how hard it is to sing with a little boy hanging on your arm. It's kind of deja vu for me from 13 years ago when I was with Gretchen as a person who didn't know if they wanted to be in the pulpit at all. <laughs> and uh, I have to, I hate to tell you this, but I haven't been in a pulpit on Sunday morning since August 15th of last year. So um, I might be a little rusty. <laughs> um, our gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Listen for a word from the Lord. Then they arrived at the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on shore, a man from the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had not worn any clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, shouting, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and he'd be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd stampeded down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told, told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, <coughs> sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then the whole throng of people of the surrounding region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of the Lord. He haunts the places of the dead. Every night the townspeople hear him shrieking among the tombs. When they're quick enough, they catch him, wrap his wrists and ankles in chains, and haul his naked body, securely shackled, back to town. But there's no containing him. He escapes every time. Trailing broken chains behind him, he wanders in the wilds, tearing at his skin until it bleeds, trading one kind of pain for another. If he has a name, no one knows it. If he has a history, no one remembers it. If he has a soul worth saving inside his living corpse, no one sees it. No one looks until Jesus does. This story of the Gerasenes demoniac is a tough one for us 21st century Christians because it's full of details we find bizarre. Chatty demons, suicidal swine, instantaneous healing. Isn't this the stuff of black comedy or horror stories? How is this ancient exorcism story good news for us? There's been much commentary written in recent decades trying to address what contemporary Christians find antiquated and troubling about this story. Was the man really possessed by demons or just mentally ill? 
And isn't there a danger involved in blending severe psychological suffering with evil? If the demons were real, why did Jesus negotiate with them? Why did he even show them mercy? And what about those poor pigs? Didn't Jesus care about them? Did they have to die for this man to be healed? And what about the economic welfare of the pig-herding townspeople who must have watched in horror as their livelihood disappeared over a cliff? These are legitimate questions, and I don't mean to dismiss them. But I wonder if focusing on the stranger parts of the story prevents us from seeing how this story can be our story, a story of our here and now. So pardon me if I sidestep the tough stuff and share why I'm haunted in a good and necessary way by the healing of this possessed man. Why his encounter with Jesus makes, makes me gasp and squirm, it makes me smile and sigh. It makes me linger and recoil. It makes me repent and return. First, I think the story is our story because it begins precisely where we ourselves need to begin. And that is with a question. What is your name? The question Jesus asked when he first encounters the possessed man by the lake. Remember, the man approaches Jesus not to ask for help, but to push Jesus away. Maybe even to scare him away. In all likelihood, his approach is violent and like a wild animal. Think a uh, zombie attack. But Jesus asks for a name anyway. And by doing so, he begins to recall the broken man to himself, to his humanity, to his beginnings, to his unique and precious identity as a beloved child of God. What is your name? Has there ever been a more loving, searching question? What would happen if we allowed Jesus to ask it of us? What would happen if we ask it of others? Who are you? Who are you really? Beneath the labels and the diagnoses, the pretense and the piety, the fear and the shame, who are you when no one in the world is watching? What name do you learn, yearn to be called in the lonely stretches of your life? Who were you before you lost yourself, before something vital in you was gone or worse? Jesus begins where we must begin with an honest questioning and naming of ourselves. Can we allow Jesus to search us so deeply? Can we hear him asking the tender and intolerable question, what is your name? Second, I believe the story is our story because it tells us an unflinching truth about our condition. Legion, the man says, in response to Jesus' question. My name is Legion. Legion. A multitude. A vast horde. A countless swarm. Literally a unit of three to six thousand men in the Roman army. Why is that his name? Well, because as Luke tells us, many demons torment him. In other words, the sources of his brokenness are countless. The assault on his mind, soul, and body are multifaceted. It comes from many sources twisted together. Perhaps it doesn't matter how we choose to explain these demons, regardless of what language we use, whether it's biblical or theological or psychological or sociological. What we know for sure is that the man's condition strips him of activity strips him of sanity and dignity, strips him from his community. It keeps him in isolation. 
It renders him anonymous. It encourages him to mutilate his own body. It deadens his soul and divides his mind. In short, it deprives him of self-control and propels him to self-destruction. Does any of this sound familiar? The truth is, what ails us as human beings is legion. The evil that haunts us has many faces, many names. We are all, every one of us, vulnerable to forces that seek to take us over, to bind our minds and our mouths, to take away our true names, and to separate us from God and from each other. You know, some people suffer from depression or anxiety. Others are addicted to sex and alcohol, wealth and thinness. Some experience the world as a deafening volume, in colors too shocking for our sensitive eyes. Some are slaves to the internet or prone to bitterness or caught up in cycles of dishonesty or in lust with our own rightness. Some can't shake traumatic memories. Some were abused as children. Some are seething with jealousy. Some are imprisoned in systems of injustice that stretch back so many centuries we can't even imagine liberation. Some experience our skin colors, our accents, our sexualities as magnets for other people's hate. Some suffer illnesses that crisscross the boundaries of medicine and culture, nature and nurture. Some know exactly what it means when Paul says, what I want to do, I do not do. And what I hate, I do. If we expand the expression of possessions to include everything that conspires to keep us dead when God wants us alive, then the story of this possessed man is not an ancient oddity at all. It's the air we breathe, the spirit of the time that we live in. It's the epidemic of our time. And that's the bad news. But it's not where the story ends. The third reason I consider the story our story is because it tells us exactly where salvation lies. And it does so without hesitation or apology. When the man sees Jesus, he falls down before him. When the townspeople come running out to see what's going on, they find the man sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Salvation, in other words, lies at the feet of Jesus. It lies in surrendering to the one who alone has the power to cast out the horrors which torment us. This is not because Jesus is some arrogant megalomaniac obsessed with his power. Rather, it's because evil in all its embodiments, in all its embodiments, finds him terrifying. It's because there is no death-dealing power in this universe that can withstand the saving, healing, resurrecting power of Jesus. It's because even the most destructive demons that we can conjure up beg for mercy when he comes to town. But is this the story that we offer the possessed who walk through our church doors every Sunday? Is it a story we even believe anymore? Or has the long haul of this thing we call Christianity, with its stretches of unanswered prayer, the, its unhealed diseases, its too frequent grinds of grief and loss and doubt and boredom, has it worn our souls and watered down our claims? The problem is, we live in this uncomfortable tension between the already and the not yet. Yes, Jesus has already defeated death. Yes, the demons already fear his name. 
Yes, we are right to look to God for healing and liberation. The Gospels witness to that so faithfully. But no, the battle is not over. No, the abyss has, hasn't swallowed up all the demons. No, the complete freedom that we seek is not yet within our grasp. But that doesn't mean the story is false. It means we have much more that we can imagine to look forward to. It means our hope is grounded in what Jesus has already done, in the power that he has already demonstrated. It means we have every reason, every reason to share the good news with confidence now. And if only we could stop there. But Luke goes one step further in the story of the possessed man. So we must too. The fourth reason to embrace this story as our own is because it illustrates an unpleasant truth about human relationships. When the townspeople see that the demon-possessed man is healed, they don't rejoice. They express no relief, no gratitude, no hospitality, no awe. Instead, they shrink back in fear and beg Jesus to go away. What does this mean? Maybe it means we humans prefer to stick with the demons we know rather than embrace freedoms we don't. Maybe it, means we, maybe it means we need some people to be bad so that we can be good. Maybe it means the shackles and chains that bind so many of God's children are the instruments of our own fears. Maybe it means we settle for tolerance instead of challenge our, challenging ourselves to love. Maybe it means the gospel doesn't always bring peace. It also brings upheaval. Messing with our moral categories, our economic comforts, and our social structures and ways, we find offensive often. Maybe it means resurrection sometimes comes along and kicks our rear end so hard we ask Jesus just to leave us alone because we'd so much rather stay dead. This story ends with Jesus commissioning the healed man to stay where he is and serve as the first missionary to his town people, the same townspeople who feared, shunned, trapped, and shackled him for years. I have to admit, this detail kind of makes me smile, although with some pain, but isn't this just like Jesus? To choose the very people we consider the most unholy, the most unredeemable, the most repulsive, the most unworthy, and commission them to teach us the gospel. That is God all over. Here, then, is a story about our truest names. Here is a story about resistance and resurrection. Here is a story about the Jesus who finds us naked among the tombs, clothes us with dignity, scatters the demons to save our souls, and turns us, turns us into storytellers. Storytellers who will help heal the world with this story. This is our story. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us to embrace the good news of this story by becoming storytellers of your good news to the world around us. Give us that strength, that compassion, that willingness to serve. Amen.
Please be seated. I think we have a new member of the choir over there. She's really good. Yeah. And she was on, she was on pitch and, and did the meter right. I mean, it was great. We come now at a time of worship when we offer before God and one another our joys and concerns before coming to God in prayer. And I just have one to mention right now. Um, and that is actually a couple prayers for my cousin Beth. Um, Beth has visited here a couple of times, I think, but she's having surgery this afternoon in Cincinnati. Um, and so prayers for her as she goes through that um, surgery and also for her family who's all in Texas and waiting for news. So prayers for Beth today, redeeming God. Hear this prayer. And Bruce, why don't you come up and share your news. Yeah. I'm letting Bruce make his own. Yeah, it's complicated. I have been scheduled for surgery tomorrow, and on Thursday found out that the fluid from around my lungs had cancer cells in it, which means there's cancer somewhere else. So they canceled the surgery. Uh, the surgeon indicated he would refer me to a, um, an oncologist for chemo and radiation. And on Friday morning, being the impatient person I am and not having a referral yet, I called a doctor friend and got a referral to an oncologist that she had used. Saw him that afternoon, discovered that uh, I have a non-smoker, so I don't have to feel guilty, uh, non-small cell cancer, which is slow growing. And it is, it, I, I have a tumor in my lower lobe, but uh, it is a um, cell mutation, strange kind of thing. Not a, not a um, genetic thing, but a somatic mutation. So it's not curable, but it's controllable. I'll, I'll be taking a pill a day for the rest of my life, and it will shrink the tumor and put me in remission. So um, God is good, and thank you. So Cheryl and I don't have to get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. And we don't have to get up at 5 a.m. and go to the hospital. We don't have to be there. We have to be there at 5. Right. So continued prayers, Bruce, as you, very touching. And, and the side best news is also that the circus doesn't have to go without you this year. So this is all good. Redeeming God, hear these prayers. Um, there are a number of prayers listed on the bulletin on your back, and I'm just going to correct one, is that um, Jill Lyon does not ask for healing. She just asks for prayers of traveling. So she's not sick. She's just traveling. So um, prayers for Jill as she travels. And if you notice, we have continuing prayers to those cities who have experienced mass shootings. We will add every week if we need to, sadly, um, another name, and the list will grow and grow. But we need to keep that front and center that we continue to pray for those cities. Redeeming God, hear these prayers. Are there other joys and concerns to be offered today? Yes, Hannah. Rachel Hope, that's a very nice name. Yeah, and my other cousin has Ruth Joy. So the name is Pastor Ruth Joy and Rachel Hope? That's pretty cool. Okay. So praise and thanksgiving for the safe delivery of Rachel Hope. Redeeming God, yeah. hear these prayers. Yes. Ellen. Oh, isn't that sweet? So prayers for your 50th anniversary. <laughs> the renewal of the vows, the 50th anniversary of the wedding itself. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> Redeeming God. Hear these prayers. Um, also prayers of Thanksgiving with Amy and Brandon. Um, Amy was a fourth grader, I believe, when I left my first call. I did her wedding a number of years ago, and they safely delivered um, twins this week, um, two girls. Um, and I will tell you this only because I'm amazed. 6'11 and 7'15. Yeah, 
they went right home from the hospital. Those babies did. So um, prayers for Amy and Brandon and their three-year-old and these two new babies with them. Redeeming God through these prayers. We remember that within our lives there are joys so abundant they cannot be voiced and sorrows so great they cannot be spoken. Let us lift now our prayers in silence. Redeeming God, hear these prayers. Gracious and loving God, you know us by name. You call us by name. You live within us and call us to your service each and every day. Hear the prayers of our hearts and our voices this day. Receive them into the arms of your loving mercy and grant them through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. My friends, do good and share what you have. Let us bring the offerings of our life, our labor, and our love to the Lord. Join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. God of generous love, we bring our gifts with grateful hearts, for we have received so much through your kindness. Bless our gifts and use them to touch lives in situations we cannot even imagine with your love. Make us a blessing in our community for the sake of Christ, our friend and Savior. Amen.
God is calling. He calls us by name to be missionaries to the people around us, to spread the good news that Christ has shown us. And so as you go from this place, may you always remember that God is with you, that God is for you, that God is ahead of you, working in your life to bring peace and love and joy to you and to the people around you. And as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the peace of our God Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit may go with you this day and forevermore. And let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.